Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com, and this is Antiwar News for Thursday, November 10th, 2022. First story at the top of Antiwar.com. The big news from Tuesday was that Russia announced its withdrawal from Kherson City. So Russia announced on Wednesday that it is pulling out of areas in the southern Ukrainian region of Kherson that are on the west bank of the Dnieper River, which includes the city, and that's the uh, capital of the oblast, Kherson, the city of Kherson. So it's a pretty major uh, withdrawal by the Russians, and it was announced by Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. He announced it in a meeting with General Sergei Survok. Uh, Suroviki, who he was just recently appointed as the commander of Russia's Russian forces in Ukraine. So Suroviki, he reported to Shoigu that keeping troops on the West Bank of the Dnieper River was not worth the risk. He said it was tough to get supplies there. And there was also claims that Russia, uh, sorry, that Ukraine could blow up a dam in the region that could cause major flooding in the region, leave troops isolated kill a lot of civilians. Uh, Russia recently accused Ukraine of shelling this dam using U.S.-provided HIMARS rocket systems. So Shoigu uh, said in a video that was released, he said, quote, start withdrawing the troops and take all measures to ensure the safe relocation of the personnel, armaments, and hardware behind the Dnieper, end quote. So if you're watching the video, you can see the map here from South Front so you see the river, this is the Dnieper River, or Dnipro River as it's also called, and then the areas highlighted in red are Russian controlled, so all these areas on the west side of the river, Russia is saying that they're going to pull out, and it includes the city. And this is an area uh, that Russia said that it annexed, that says it's now part of Russia, so, you know, PR-wise, this is a pretty big defeat for Russia uh, pulling out of that area that they these areas that they said they would be Russia forever, as the, the Kremlin has put it. Um, but Russia has been evacuating civilians out of this region for for weeks now, for a while. And Shoigu said that the full withdrawal was to protect Russian troops as well as civilians in the region. He said, quote, for us, the life and health of Russian servicemen is always a priority. We must also take into account the threat for the civilian population, end quote. Um, so when, you know, if Ukraine comes back in here and takes the city, um, as we know just from reports of them retaking other areas, is, uh, the, you know, there's going to be reprisals and stuff for, for people that uh, were co collaborated with the Russians or were just sympathetic to the Russians. Um, so that could be part of the reason why they were pulling civilians out for a while. Maybe they... They had this planned uh, for a while. And I remember a, an official uh, in Kursan, a Russian installed official in that region, said a few weeks ago or maybe a week ago that it was possible that they were going to pull out of this area. Um, and Ukrainian officials, they're still skeptical that Russia is fully withdrawing from the area. Uh, an advisor to Zelensky said that it was too early to confirm if Russia was pulling out. He said, quote, until the Ukrainian flag is flying over Kherson, it makes no sense to talk about a Russian withdrawal, end quote. According to some media reports, and I'm going to get more into this in the next story, a Russian withdrawal from Kherson could potentially open the door to diplomacy. TASS reported this week, that's the Russian news agency, uh, they cited this Italian newspaper, La Repubblica, that the U.S. and NATO may think that peace talks are possible if Ukraine retakes Kherson. Um, again, let me go to the next story because um, it's more about the diplomacy aspect. So the next one here, this was NBC News reported this on Wednesday, that some U.S. and Western officials believe that this winter will provide an opportunity for diplomacy between Russia and Ukraine as they do not believe either side can fully achieve their goals in the war. So one Western official told NBC, quote, in the winter, everything slows down. The potential for talks, we would like to see that happening, end quote. So this seems to mark, a, I mean, you know, they say Western officials in France and Germany and other countries, they've been kind of calling for diplomacy uh, throughout the war, unlike the U.S. that has been 
Um, the U.S. and Britain and the Eastern European countries have been more hawkish than the Western European countries. Um, but this is saying you, some U.S. officials uh, are hoping for a diplomatic solution. Um, you know, who knows how true this is? It's a report in, in NBC News, but it seems to be a message that they want to at least put out there. So it's a change. Uh, and we've seen a few things like this lately. And uh, just again, to reiterate that Russia announced it was leaving Kherson, and that Italian newspaper report said that the U.S. and NATO think that that peace talks could be possible if Ukraine takes Kherson. And then, and what was interesting is another thing that the reasons why they said the US and NATO were considering diplomacy, one, due to the threat of tactical nuclear weapons being used, and two, due to the fact that if Russia is defeated in Ukraine, it will become closer to China. Uh, or if Putin is replaced, if there's regime change, I mean that it would never get to that point. I don't think without nukes being used, um, you know, they're not going to let NATO invade Russia. Um, but they're basically seem to recognize that if Putin's replaced, the whoever replaces them will probably be more hawkish and go harder in Ukraine, and will uh, be closer to China. Because China is the ultimate priority for them. It's, it sounds like if we're to believe what the U.S. And, and the U.K. and they're all saying that China is the top threat, so-called threat. Um, but speaking of this curse on thing, so this NBC News report, they also said that if Ukraine takes curse on, that the Zelensky government would be in a better position to negotiate. So again, we're seeing U.S. Western officials saying if they take this city, which it appears like they are now, uh, we, we don't know yet if Russia, if I don't think Russia's fully withdrawn from the region yet, but it does look like Ukraine's moving in there. They're saying this means more diplomacy could happen. Uh, however, these officials did say that they think it will make Putin's government less likely, less likely to negotiate if they lose Kherson, but you know they always tend to ignore what russia is actually saying and what russia said on wednesday they reaffirmed again you know the same day they announced this withdrawal that they're open to talks and this is russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman maria zakharova she said quote we are ready to negotiate of course taking into account the realities that are emerging at the moment end quote so throughout the war, the U.S. has maintained that it will not push Ukraine to the negotiating table. That's been the position for over eight months now. The U.S. and its allies have also discouraged peace talks. We have to remind everybody of this, that there was a deal within reach at the end of March and early April after in-person negotiations between Ukraine and Russia in Istanbul. And Boris Johnson went over to Kiev, told them not to negotiate. And according to Ukrainian media, he said, even if you're ready to sign a deal, we're not. And he was speaking for the collective West, as they said. Um, but now there does appear to be a shift in the Western approach with the U.S. at least exploring the idea of diplomacy. So there is more about Jake Sullivan's visit to Kiev in this NBC News report. And it said when he was there, he broached the idea of diplomacy with Zelensky. They said he didn't want to pressure Ukraine to negotiate, but said Kiev should still should consider changing its stance on negotiations. So we've seen multiple reports on this. The U.S. encouraging Zelensky to drop his position that he will not negotiate with Russia as long as Putin is president. And then this week he said that he's open to negotiations with Russia, but he maintained these demands that are non-starters, which is a full Russian withdrawal, Russia paying compensation for war damages, I mean, even before negotiations. So it's just something that's never going to happen. Um, so it is important to note, while there's this talk of diplomacy, Ukraine's still taking a very hard line. And the U.S. and NATO also have big plans. Um, let's not forget that, that the U.S. just established is establishing this new command in Germany to oversee arming and training Ukraine. And NATO has a 10-year plan to uh, beef up Ukraine's military and make it interoperable with basically making it a de facto NATO member, which it really is already. Um, and Russia has also been reinforcing its positions in eastern Ukraine after mobilizing 300,000 fresh troops. So in a, a Russian offensive could also be coming. Um, so, you know, this these are just, I think, uh, 
as Ted Snyder put it in his column yesterday, slivers of hope. And I think these are bigger slivers than than we've seen uh, this NBC News report. And of course, Congress is planning to pass another massive aid package for Ukraine. So that's another sign that 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 they're not too keen on a diplomatic solution working out too soon. And according to NBC, it could be somewhere between 40 and 60 billion. But still, I think this is kind of big news, just the fact that they're putting this out there. All right, the next one. Here's another sign that, you know, we're not, we're not done yet. Uh, Ukrainian lawmakers are going to send a delegation to the U.S. to meet with newly elected members of Congress. So members of Ukraine's parliament are planning a trip to Washington in December to meet the uh, people that have won uh, the midterm elections to ensure that bipartisan support for spending on the war in Ukraine continues. So a red wave was predicted for Tuesday's election, uh, but Republicans did not have as much success as expected. So as of Wednesday night, not all races have been called. There's still a few big ones that haven't been called yet. But it does appear that Republicans are going to eke out a majority in the House uh, while the Senate is still up in the air. Um, But Kevin McCarthy, who's the House Minority Leader, he's announced his bid for House Speaker on Wednesday. So it seems like uh, he he thinks they're going to get it. And it does look like, I'm, I'm pretty sure we could almost say with certainty that Republicans are going to control the House by a very small minor- majority. Um, but McCarthy is the one whose comments, even though he's a staunch Ukraine supporter, I mean, he's been pretty bad on this issue. Uh, he said that a Republican-controlled House won't be willing to write a blank check for Ukraine. Um, but other Republicans, and for the most part, overall Republicans are into spending on this war. Um, and they're insisting that support for Ukraine will continue. And Ukrainian officials expect that it, they're not too worried about it. So Vladimir Ariev, he's a Ukrainian member of parliament in the European Solidarity Party. <laughs> he said that Kiev needs to work to maintain bipartisan support in Washington in, in the wake of the midterms. He said, quote, we need to maintain our contacts and communication with both parties. We need to extend it, we need to intensify it, and we need to talk to both parties for support, end quote. So he said that Ukraine's parliament plans to send a delegation of about a dozen lawmakers from the ruling Servant of the People Party. That's uh, Zelensky's party. That's also the name of the TV show that he was a star in. And um, so they're going to go the ruling party and opposition parties, European Solidarity, Fatherland, and Holos. Although uh, Zelensky banned his chief opposition his biggest opposition, opposition platform for life, and 10 other opposition parties after Russia first invaded. It's just important to note that because a a party with the name European Solidarity doesn't seem like they're really going to be opposing what Zelensky's been up to. Um, So Ariyev said that the Ukrainian delegation will attend a security conference in Washington and seek meetings with newly elected Democrats and Republicans. He said the delegation will propose a larger role for Congress in overseeing the aid being sent to Ukraine as one of the main criticisms of the policy is the lack of oversight. And um, again, I just repeat that uh, Congress is looking to spend apparently before the new Congress is sworn in, they want to pass another massive aid package for Ukraine. Um, And another sign here that we're going to keep on going is that the European Commission, the EU's uh, European Commission, they've proposed an 18 billion uh, billion euro aid package for Ukraine, which right now euros and dollars are almost equal. Um, According to the Reuters article, 18 billion euros is 18.06 billion dollars. But the European Commission, they proposed this big aid package for Ukraine, 18 billion euros. And the idea is to help the country with its budget deficit for 2023. And it would be dispersed through loans throughout 2023 and would average about 1.5 billion euros or dollars each month. And the U.S. is expected to put up a similar amount as Ukraine has passed a budget with a $38 billion deficit. And the IMF estimates that the Ukrainian government is going to need 3 to 4 billion each month to get by. But the EU's proposed aid is facing resistance from Hungary. Uh, Hungary's finance minister said that Hungary is willing to support Ukraine, but they don't want to contribute to a loan being taken up by the EU. 
So to send this money to Ukraine, the EU's 27 members would need to jointly borrow the funds and Kiev would have 35 years to pay it back. So the chief of staff for uh, Viktor Orban, uh, the Hungarian prime minister, he said Hungary has not agreed on this plan to jointly borrow the money. And the European commissioner, Valdis Dombrovsky, he said that they're working to alleviate Hungary's concerns. So Hungary, uh, they have they tend to hold up sanctions against Russia. They're not really on board with everything, but they eventually seem to drop their opposition. They, they have gotten a few things changed, um, but we'll see how uh, how firm they'll keep it up against against this aid package. Uh, the next one here is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. The U.S. approves a, har- a high Mars sale to Lithuania. So more arms sales for the Baltic states and Eastern Europe. The State Department greenlit a nearly $500 million sale of the high mobility artillery rocket systems. That's the high Mars to Lithuania. Washington transferred dozens of the systems to Kiev that Ukrainian forces have used to carry out attacks inside territory claimed by Russia. So the press release from the Defense Security Cooperation Agency stated that um, Lithuania requested eight launchers, ammunition, and other equipment for the HIMARS. The DSCA claimed the weapon sale supports Washington's foreign policy objectives, which are all about selling weapons and making money. <laughs> and so the HIMARS are made by Lockheed Martin. They're ramping up production of these, these rockets, and it looks like um, they're going to be selling a lot more. I believe maybe it wasn't the HIMARS, but it was something similar that they just announced they're selling to Finland. All right, the next one here is from Jason Ditz. This is a big one. Uh, Israel attacks a convoy on the Syria-Iraq border, at least 10 killed. So there's a pretty major airstrikes inside Syria on the Syria-Iraq border that targeted a convoy um, going into Syria from Iraq. And it was on Tuesday night. It was hit by airstrikes. Originally, initially, it wasn't clear who did it, uh, but is. The U.S. was suspected, but now it it seems like it's Israel. Because um, when the U.S. launches airstrikes like this in Iraq or, or Syria, they usually claim them. Israel, on the other hand, doesn't. But this has come out through leaks in the media that it was an Israeli airstrike. And at least 10 are killed. Some reports put the figure as high as 15. And according to these reports, it was a fuel convoy going to Lebanon uh, sent by Iran. Um, and reports have said that some Iranian nationals are among the slain in the convoy. Some are speculating that the convoy was smuggling weapons, since this is often the excuse for Israeli attacks inside Syria. Um, so the Israeli attacks on fuel convoys aren't as common, but they do attack anything, even with a hint of Iranian involvement. So it seems to be kind of just a continuation of Israeli airstrikes in Syria, um, and it took place in Al Qam, which is a, the main border crossing area from Iraq to Syria. And it's often the site of attacks and has a substantial pre- presence of Iraqi Shia militias. Um, so lately, Israel's airstrikes against Syria have been more targeting around Damascus and Syrian government targets. Uh, and the U.S. does, you know, if these are Shia militias, who who really knows? It's not really clear who, who was targeted here. If it was a convoy, it might, could have just been a civilian convoy. Um, but the U.S. does carry out airstrikes like this in that region from time to time. So the US, that's why the U.S. was suspected at first. But it does look like it's been Israel. And then I put this up. Um, uh, in a, a militia claims responsibility for killing an American citizen in Baghdad. So an armed militia calling itself Ashab al Kaf claimed responsibility on Tuesday for the killing of American citizen Stephen Troll. He was killed in Baghdad on Monday evening, and this is according to Al Arabiya News. So the armed faction said that they killed Troll, who I didn't couldn't find too much information on him. He's an American in Iraq. Uh, I read in one report that he was an aid worker, but they're saying that they killed him in retaliation for the killing of Qasem Soleimani, who was the IRGC Quds Force commander that was killed in Iraq in January 2020. 
and also Abu Mahdi al muhandis who was killed alongside Soleimani, he was the head of the Popular Mobilization Forces, which is a group of Iraqi Shia militias that were formed to fight ISIS. They were on the U.S. side against ISIS, so was Soleimani. Then when that war was over, the U.S. started bombing the Shias, and uh, it culminated with the killing of Soleimani. Uh, so the reason I just put this up just because... Uh, those airstrikes, those Israeli airstrikes kind of reminded me that, you know, the U.S. maybe because of this militia claims and this guy getting killed, they might look to, to attack one of these militias that's taken credit. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some U.S. airstrikes in Iraq or Syria. Uh, I, I don't know. It's just something to keep an eye on. All right. The next one here, Israel's Gantz says that Netanyahu will be level headed about attacking Iran. So outgoing Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz, he said on Wednesday that he expects Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the presumed incoming prime minister, to take a level headed approach to the prospect of attacking Iran. Um, so Gantz's comments come after a Netanyahu ally in the Likud, in the Likud party. That's Netanyahu's party said that when Netanyahu takes over Israel's government, uh, he's probably he's going to strike Iran if the U.S. does not lock in a new nuclear deal. Um, so the Israelis are still claiming that Iran is working to build a nuclear weapon, even though the U.S.'s new nuclear posture review says that that is not the case. It says that Iran has not made the decision to build a nuclear weapon. So Gantz also claimed that the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, has now now has the capability to attack Iranian nuclear sites. But he said that he believes Netanyahu will be level-headed in this regard, as he put it. Um, so I guess this is just a response to that Likud guy saying, you know, he's going to come in and start bombing Iran. Uh, you know, it's definitely a possibility. But um, And the question is if, if Israel actually has the capability. So Gantz says that they do. And the IDF, in recent years, they've said that they're accelerating their plans to attack Iran. They've gotten funding specifically for the purpose of preparing to bomb Iran. They've simulated bombing the country in military exercises. Um, but the question is, it, you know, they don't have bunker, bunker, bunker busting bombs that they need to destroy Uranium nuclear facilities that have been built deep underground in response to Israeli covert attacks. That's why they started building underground is because of that. Um, and then it's also not clear if their planes are able to fly to Iran to bomb it and then fly back to Israel. Israel currently relies on aging tankers for mid-air refueling, and they're said to not be capable of supporting attacks on Iran. And the U.S. has inked a deal with Israel to sell them four Boeing-made KC-46 refueling planes that Israel would be able to use them to go bomb Iran. But they're not going to be delivered until the earliest 2025. So so Gant, what Gantz is saying might not be true. Um, and then also, so you know, forget the bunker-busting thing if they just wanted to bomb Iran because it's, it's not really about them developing a nuclear weapon. Uh, you know, maybe they could just fly some planes over there and bomb some other targets. Um, so that's always a possibility too. And I believe if they landed in Bahrain or the UAE to refuel, that's a possibility. And they're, they're, uh, since they normalized, maybe that's an option for them. Um, so, but, you know, I wouldn't expect Netanyahu to just come in and attack Iran, but he's definitely going to be very hawkish as he's always been. But that's also the way to Lapid and, um, uh, ha has been, you know, Netanyahu, uh, in a way, uh, you know, he's just more known to be a hawk, to be, you know, extreme uh, than than the others. But the others are really just as bad as he is. Um, but anyway, and then the next one that we have up here is Herzog, who is the Israeli president. He was caught on a hot mic saying that the entire world is anxious about Ben Gavir who is this extremist far-right um, Israeli lawmaker that is set to become a minister in Netanyahu's coalition government. Um, so Herzog's remarks were made, seemingly made while thinking a microphone he had was off, came as he met with party representatives at his official residence in Jerusalem to hear their formal recommendations of who should lead the next government. Um, so 
it'll just be interesting to see what happens with this Ben Gavir guy um, who has supported Jewish terrorism. Uh, and this is uh, what the Israeli media says uh, and, and conservative groups in Israel, they don't want him to be involved. They think he's just, he's just, uh, he's just too, a little too much for them, I guess. Uh, but that's it for the news for today. Uh, again, it was another, you know, with these elections, it seems like most of the news was elections, but the big news, Russia pulling out a curse on and, and talk of diplomacy. Hopefully that goes somewhere, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, we have a lot of good viewpoints as always. You could go check those out. Um, if you want to support the show, you can go to antiwar.com slash donate. You can follow us on Twitter, follow antiwar.com on Twitter, follow me on Twitter. Um, Contact the show, news at antiwar.com. Subscribe on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey if you want the video. Share the show. You can download audio wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave reviews on Apple Podcasts. That stuff all helps out. Uh, But that's it for me. I will catch you tomorrow. Thanks for listening.